Hi everyone, I'm Jeff. I'm an engineer at Sphero, uh, and just like you, I'm at home. I'm working from my basement right now. You might even be able to hear my kids playing upstairs, which is pretty cool uh, during this video. Uh, if you've been following along in our series, you know that we've been talking all about how robots are just like the human body. Uh, uh, my specialty is firmware engineering, so I'll be talking to you all about how the robot thinks and how it communicates and how it senses the world around it and knows that it's spinning, moving, uh, and things like that. Uh, pretty exciting. Let's go. Let's start with the first basic question. What even is firmware? This is the tech stack at Sphero, starting with the mechanics all the way at the bottom, up through electrical, through this mystery layer, firmware, up to the applications that you use to drive the robot. The mechanics are like the skeletal system of the robot. It's, it's all the stuff that holds the robot together and the things that move, gears and the chassis. The electrical layer has motors and lights that shine through the panels. It's the electronic system and nerve endings like sensors. Up at the top, the apps have joysticks and programming canvases that tell the robot what to do. And here, firmware, is where we interpret all of the messages and instructions from your application and use it to drive the hardware underneath in a smart way. Without firmware, when you turn on a motor, it would just flip on, and when you turn it off, it just flips off, but it would have no idea really where it was going or what you wanted it to do. Firmware allows you to do complicated stuff, like driving a particular direction and speed exactly the way you want it to go, or to interpret a sensor from the layers underneath, like not just seeing a color, but knowing exactly what color you are seeing, uh, to say not just, I have these values, but that's red, which is a pretty cool and sort of complicated task. And all of that information lives in a processor, a couple processors uh, in some of our robots, inside this black box, which is firmware. We write software, just like the software engineers, but unlike software engineers, our code runs inside the robot and their code runs up inside the phone. Now that we understand what firmware is, let's talk a little bit more about what it's doing inside the robot and how those functions are just like parts in the human body. Uh, in particular, let's start with the brain, because the firmware is mostly like a brain. It's code that's running inside microcontrollers inside the robot. A microcontroller is just like a processor inside your computer or your phone, and it is like a brain. It thinks, it does math operations, and in particular, it's the junction between your intentions and getting your body to do the thing you want to do. You think, I'm going to walk over here. Oh, okay, let's move my legs. That's what firmware is doing. Now, some robots have one brain, but some robots have many brains. And in particular, uh, as an example, Rover has two brains. We have the master brain up top, the main brain, and a secondary brain down underneath. The primary brain up top is responsible for all sorts of different functions and really controls what the system's doing. And the two processors work together to do all the different things you see the robot do and get all the sensor information you want. Uh, on sensors, the main brain takes care of our color sensor and our ambient light sensor, as well as controlling all of the LEDs and all of the animations you see and setting the colors you want. With the sensors, the job of firmware is to interpret the data we're receiving. Like if the color sensor, which has three elements, red, green, blue, to see all the colors in the whole spectrum, says, well, my red sensor has six units and my green sensor has four units and my blue sensor has no units. What is that? The firmware churns on that, does a whole bunch of math, and says, okay, that is definitively yellow, and it is sort of like the yellow that the user's looking for, let's say with a confidence of 75%. Let's tell the user what's happening. Well, it uses another peripheral inside the microcontroller to talk through the, the radio up to the phone. One of the main functions of this processor is that radio connection. It's how the phone sends instructions down and request data back up, and we'll talk a lot about that a little bit later on. The main brain also takes care of the entire power system, tracking how much battery power we have left, uh, and in some systems where you charge while the battery's in, uh, it takes care of power notifications, as well as turning itself off. And finally, this is our firmware update master in the system. Whenever you're sending new firmware down from us where we've given some new feature, that's coming through this guy and being distributed throughout the system. The secondary processor, this second brain, is mostly responsible for driving. It has outputs into the motors to set them, give them power, and a number of sensors we use to check that that power is doing what we want it to do. I mentioned earlier that if you just 
turned the switch on on the motors or turned it off, the motors would jerk forward or just stop. It wouldn't be very pleasant and it wouldn't ensure you're actually doing the right thing. You can imagine just dumping gas in, a, in an engine and then going up a hill or down a hill. Well, when you go up the hill, you go a little bit slower and down the hill, you go way faster. You have to measure what's happening so that you control and make sure you're going the right speed and direction. And that combination of sensors and some sort of actuator in the world is called a control system. We use the feedback from the sensors to guarantee we're doing the right thing. Uh, those three sensors in this particular case, we have quadrature encoders that measure the rotational velocity of the wheels, how fast they're spinning. We have an accelerometer that measures force back and forth as well as gravity and a gyroscope. And the gyroscope measures how much we're spinning and we use that to get our attitude and our uh, yaw inside the world. Uh, and again, all of those get paired together in the brain to make sure we're doing exactly what the user wants. Now this processor also does a couple other side things. We use it for communication channel down to uh, third party hardware like the Raspberry Pi or a uh, microbit or an Arduino. And it, that functions a lot like the connection up to the phone. Uh, this processor just happens to have the USB and UART, so we use this channel down below. We also use the infrared to send and receive information to other Sphero robots. And this is pretty cool. This allows us to do games like tag or to have robots follow each other. And we'll be talking a lot more about that a little bit later on. Let's move on to the mouth and ears and talk about how the robot talks and listens to other systems around it. Uh, this could be your phone or your tablet or your computer or even another robot. When we're talking to a phone or a computer, we use a technology called Bluetooth. And this is a digital radio signal that we use to communicate. Now, radio signals can be analog or digital. Uh, analog was used, like if you tuned into an AM radio station and listened, you're listening to analog waves that are more or less analogous to the audio signal you're hearing. If you were to look at that radio signal, there is something about it that moves the same way as the pressure waves that would hit your ear. What we use is a digital signal, and this is what you'd see in modern radio as well, as well as Wi-Fi and other Bluetooth accessories like your, your headphones. All of these use packets of information that are digitized. Uh, this communication is highly reliable uh, and allows us to send information, data we need to and from the phone. So we use two antennas, one inside the robot and one inside your phone, and they use radio waves to transmit packets back and forth. We chain a bunch of those packets together to make messages that we want to use to receive commands or to send up sensor data. And this ends up forming a number of different layers to create these signals that are interpreted by the brain we talked about earlier. All the way down at the bottom, radio is a continuous signal. It is not by its nature digital. Up a layer, you have a protocol like Bluetooth that digitizes it, uh, forms packets, and has checking around the packets to make sure they were received correctly. And up a layer even further, you have the Sphero protocol. We actually have two protocols that firmware uh, uses in its brain. One of them is just ones and zeros that we use to send very fast communication. That's how your phone talks. And the engineers, we use a human readable uh, protocol. If you've ever typed on a command line on your computer, it's a lot like that. I can type ver and get the firmware version information uh, because firmware engineers, for some reason, shorten words like version to ver. Uh, I guess we don't want to use the extra four letters. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but you can also set the LED command to send, uh, turn the LEDs on. Uh, that's how we develop quickly. We can just type on our computer and say, hey, turn your lights on. Uh, it's a lot easier in that secondary language to work with it directly. Uh, but the binary language is much faster and is much better for communication of big hunks of information, uh, like sensor data going up and down, uh, driving instructions coming back from the phone, or brand new firmware that you're uploading. Uh, when you get a new feature from us. So this is where the analogy breaks down just a little, but in a pretty awesome way. Unlike your mouth and ears, a Bluetooth antenna is just a single thing. The mouth is the ears, and that's accomplished by time sharing. Sometimes it's talking, and sometimes it's listening. So the robot takes a turn, and it's talking out its antenna, transmitting. And while it's doing that, the phone is listening, it's receiving. And then the phone gets a turn to transmit, and then the robot gets a chance to listen. Uh, it's sort of like a good conversation. You spend a little time talking, then you spend a little time listening. It's pretty cool. It's using a single line to do both, uh, both things. 
Now, a little bit more like your mouth and your ears is the infrared system. And this is what we use to communicate with other robots to send short packets of information back and forth. This has a distinct sender, your mouth, and a distinct receiver, your ears. And each participant has a mouth and ears to talk and listen. Now, I've colored these red, but in reality, infrared is just below red on the spectrum. And it's so below that you actually can't see it. It's invisible. But a uh, side trick, if you want to see infrared, you can using your cell phone camera. Take your cell phone camera and point it at your uh, remote control on your TV or a security camera or a baby cam at night when those lights come on to see in the dark, and you'll see a faint pink or purple uh, glow where those LEDs are. And you'll actually see the digital chatter on a TV remote flashing out the code that the TV uses to turn on or off or change the channel. And this is because the cameras on your phone don't fully filter out the infrared light. Uh, it's pretty awesome. Uh, if you think that's awesome, then you are awesome. So we use an LED that shines infrared light and a light sensor on the other side that can see that spectrum. And again, this is just like a visible light sensor, the ambient light sensor or the color sensor we have on board. It just happens to be tuned to see infrared light. Now, like Bluetooth, while we could be sensing uh, its brightness, like a little bright, very bright, very, very, very bright, we don't. We just use patterns of ons and offs. We digitize the signal to send a reliable packet of information back and forth. This allows us to transmit codes uh, over distance. We use this for all sorts of stuff. Uh, you can program what these do inside the applications. We also use it for an onboard following feature where it sends messages like, I'm over here, I'm over here. And when the sensor sees it, it knows to follow. And again, you can see how by sending and receiving, this is just like talking and listening. And those get interpreted by firmware in the brain, just like in your body. Now we get to talk about my favorite sensor in the whole system. It's actually two sensors that we put together, the accelerometer and the gyroscope. Together, these tell us what orientation the robot is and how it's moving in the world around us. And it works exactly, or very close to exactly, how your inner ear works. Your inner ear has some fluid inside of it, and it's part of how you sense gravity is down, or if you're spinning and that fluid sloshes up to the side, how you know that you're spinning a certain direction. It's also how you get dizzy. So we have these two sensors, the accelerometer that senses motion back and forth and up and down. And in fact, your whole body is a lot like an accelerometer. Have you ever noticed that when you're on an airplane and you're going super fast, it doesn't really feel like you're moving that much? And I mean, even right now, you're sitting in your house, the Earth is spinning unbelievably fast, so fast that you go all the way around in a single day. That's crazy fast, but it doesn't feel like you're moving at all. That's because your body doesn't sense speed. It senses changes in speed, and a change in speed is acceleration. And that is exactly what an accelerometer measures. When you speed up in a car and you feel yourself being pulled back into your seat, or you stop and you jerk forward, that's an acceleration you're feeling. And that's just how these work. We measure in three axes, up and down, forward and backward, and left and right, and use that information to sense all the different directions. Like if you go up and forward, that diagonal line is measured on these two sensors. This also allows us to measure gravity. A pretty cool fact about reality is that gravity is itself a force. It's an acceleration. So the same sensor that would sense being jerked forward or back allows you to sense that gravity is pulling you forward, even when you're at rest. Okay, the gyroscope is just like the accelerometer, but what it senses is rotational speed. And this is that sloshing of the, the fluid up in your inner ears and the moving of those hairs in your inner ear. We sense rotation around each of these three axes. Uh, generally speaking, we call this rotation yaw, this rotation pitch, and this rotation roll. You take all three of those together and you can sense any uh, movement around an axis like this uh, that you could do. Now this uh, measures the speed at which you're rotating. But what we really want to know in a robot is what direction are you facing? And if you've done a little calculus, just like you know uh, that a change in velocity is acceleration, well, uh, if you add a whole bunch of speeds together, you get direction. So when we add 
all of our rotational velocities together, we integrate them, you get an orientation. We use the orientation that we get out of that summation, the integration of this information, and pair it with our special knowledge that gravity is down, and together those allow us to sense what position the robot is in. We sort of magically know that you're pointed up, even though we're not measuring what direction you're pointed. We're measuring where is gravity and how fast am I rotating. It's pretty awesome. All of these go together to let us drive exactly the way we want to drive. As I mentioned earlier, we use this as part of the control system so that you can go just where you want to go and that information is processed up in the brain. But there's also another pretty cool usage. If you have the Play app, uh, which you can connect to some of our Sphero robots, like Mini, uh, which is my favorite robot, uh, you can actually use this system just as a controller. We have games in there where you can move the Mini around and use this information uh, just to control the game. It's pretty incredible. And if you're programming inside the EDU app, you can even use that to make your own game. Uh, when it was uh, Hanukkah, I made a dreidel program, spun it around and landed on a side and uh, shin. I guess I have to put one in. Cool. Well, this was fun. Uh, thanks for watching. I hope you had as much fun as I did. We got to learn about how firmware was like the brain, the mouth and the ears, and the inner ear, and how the robot interacts with the world around it just like you do. If you have questions or comments about this video, or you have ideas for a future video, uh, tweet us at Sphero and say hi. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks, and enjoy your time at home.